gaps to the holes it included. Waste is from the retail to the consumer. It's important because the numbers are different. It's 13.2% for losses and 17% for waste. Now, we have to be careful because we cannot add these numbers. There is some overlap in the definitions. More or less, we're talking of a third. That's why we refer to a third of losses and waste. But let's be careful. If we want to be scientific, we cannot add them up. The overlap is not so big. Now, what we know today, as I said, in the world is 13.2 of losses, and that's the distribution across different continents. Sub-Saharan Africa, the bigger one, with 20%. North America and Europe also have 9.2%. But the most vulnerable countries, the most vulnerable regions, are the ones with the biggest levels of losses today. And again, we need to put efforts to reduce that, because that's where the hunger is, where the biggest numbers of hunger are. And also, we know that global regional food supply per kilogram per capita loss is enormous. In the case of the world, 931 million metric tons. That means 120 kilograms per capita. And you can see the evolution across the countries. But even the data that we have today, we can disaggregate this by type of, of products. And we can see how much is on cereals and pulses, how much is on meat and animal products, fruits and tubers, and bearing crops, and fruits and vegetables. So I start thinking of our, our composition of these healthy diets, which is supposed to have all these types of foods together. That's the diversity of a diet, no? But look especially at fruits and vegetables, how big they are. And this is reflected in why the cost of the minimum healthy diet is so high, because we cannot combine these different types of foods, because we are losing and wasting an enormous share of those. So we are talking that in, in fruits and vegetables, we are over 30% of losses and waste. So big changes need to happen, and we need to do a lot of work to keep improving the way we produce, but also the way we consume, and the incentives that are behind so that we can reduce this level of losses and waste. Here, FAO started to do an exercise looking at, at the value chain and looking at commodities in different countries. So this is an example for Peru, Ecuador, Guatemala, Honduras, Ethiopia, China, Ghana, Mozambique, and Tanzania for different types of products. And the exercise here was to understand if the losses, this, we are talking of losses in the production side, not of waste, were happening at the producer side pre-harvest or were happening post-harvest. And what we found in this study using different methodologies to look at the process or the middleman and the farmer is that most of the losses happen at the farmer level because the processors and the middleman will select what they want to use. But also we found when we decompose the farmer level is that most of them happen pre-harvest. And most of the literature today is on post-harvest and solutions to post-harvest losses when many of the problems are happening at the pre-harvest level. So it's something to look at and something to keep exploring and learning from what we have. But we also have that if we are able to achieve the change that we want, and we reduce food loss and waste by 50%, there will be sufficient fruits and vegetables available in the supply chain to cover the recommendations globally of the amount of grams you need per person per day. So the impact is not only on the environment, the impact is also on the diets, and of course, on the nutrition of, of individuals that need to use these resources that we are losing or wasting as we produce. Now, there are good important things here. First is three potential impacts of reduction of losses and waste. We have improved food security and nutrition, uh, as I have been explaining. We will have improved productivity and economic growth because farmers could learn more if they differentiate the product because they comply with the standards and quality. And of course, we improve and we use more efficiently our natural resources and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Why is this so important? Because if we want to create a transition, we call it the just transition, we need to have two elements there, efficiency gains, and here we have a lot of efficiency gains, and we need to rebalance. And rebalance meaning is that we need to find ways in which consumers change their diets when they overconsume because they will create non-communicable diseases, the health externalities, and they underconsume because they don't have access to the, the, the food that they need to have this access to healthy diets. So food loss and waste could create a significant impact in this process. And we did a literature review to try to assess what the outcomes that this will create. And if you look in this table and you look at this column, this row, sorry, reducing loss and, and overconsumption, and also you have reducing of food losses, you will see that the impacts, with one rare exception, are lower green, which means that we have positive impacts and not trade-offs, both in food availability, in food access, in smallholder income, and in environmental outcomes. 
That's what the literature is telling us. So it's one of the cases where I will have this triple win. And we didn't stop there. We also simulate those impacts. And we compare those impacts looking at other types of, of interventions. And these interventions are here. You have farm sub subsidizing. You have innovation. You have innovation or a type of innovation with land fix. You have food loss and waste reduction. And you have full package of interventions. In terms of reduction of undernourishment, food losses helps. It doesn't perform as well as other innovations and so on, which are more comprehensive. But when we look at the trade-offs, which are the different trade-offs in emissions, in energy, in agriculture, in agricultural land, in forest habitat, and in chemical use, the purple is food loss and waste. In all the cases, it's overperforming. So the simulations told us that these interventions improve reduction of hunger, but at the same time, is the one that reduces more externalities and create the most positive impact in all those different dimensions of the externalities. That's the third benefit of reduction of food loss and waste. And we need to look carefully to all the environmental changes, and that's where we need to start targeting. And I won't bore you too much with this, but basically what we want to understand is how we can create a reduction of the increase that we are observing in the agri-food systems of global emissions, and how we can target interventions to really reduce losses and reduce those trade-offs. Now, let me tell you a little bit where we are right now. So we're looking at all the value chains in different sectors and different regions and trying to identify where are the critical points and what types of interventions we need to do to reduce losses. And here is where we want to expand our network as much as possible to figure out what we can do in each different sector. So in each region, cereals, fruits, in meat, what we can do to reduce and identify those critical points across the value chain. But to be able to do that, we need to collect data. We need to bring reliable data. And FAO has been working intensively in bringing them, informing the reduction of losses, informing the greenhouse gas emissions, and increasing the supply chain efficiency. And all this data is public, and you can download it from the website. But we also have created an app, the FLAP, the Food Loss App. And the FLAP, what it does is allow us to crowdsourcing information of losses. Many private sector companies today are trying to put targets of reduction of losses, but they don't have baselines. What this app does is applies a methodology that we have tested over time, where you will get a questionnaire, and the farmer can self-report. And today we have evidence, because we have tested this with real data collection and with also real field analysis of losses, that this set of questions that take 20 minutes for the farmer predicts very well the amount of losses they have. Not only that, we also add solutions to the problems they face using videos from Swabo that has been working with the support of the US government and helping us to bring very practical solutions in videos to the farmers to the problems they face. So we hope that we can expand this up uh, and share it with private companies and with people collecting this type of data so that we can standardize the way we collect uh, this data. And finally, we have been working in normative standard settings. We also have uh, some code of conduct for food losses that has been developed, voluntary guidelines that we can implement and work together to move forward. So, there is also what we call the, the, the partnerships and networks. We have the Food is Never Waste Coalition, which was launched in the Food System Summit in 2021. And it's a multi-stakeholder partnership that tries to bring partners together to accelerate this process. And we have the, the one, two, three food loss and waste pledge for climate action that is also going to happen here, which is trying to start in COP27, and we're trying to bring companies to pledge commitments to be able to reduce that. So all the different dimensions of efforts that we can do to bring this together will be sent. Just move one slide forward. Okay, and finally, and I stop here, this is the roadmap that we are working and we are going to launch here on the 10th of this month in the, in the COP28. And the roadmap brings what I said before good food for today and tomorrow. And food losses is one of the 10 domains of actions that we're going to work. The roadmap will be a three-year effort. In this year, we look at the global level with one of the domains being food loss and waste reduction. In 2029, we will look at the regional level and cost the interventions. And in 2013, of the Brazil, we will look at the country level, trying to converge the transformations that we need. So thank you so much. And sorry if I move too fast. Thank you.
thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Torero, Chief Economist of FAO, for that uh, very, very uh, captivating and I, I believe also very uh, in depth in terms of the analysis that has been uh, con conducted to provide the evidence to back why we need to uh, carry out urgent action in this area. So we're going to have uh, our panelists now move to the uh, the chairs, and then we will uh, start uh, bringing the panelists in to have the discussion. So first of all, we have uh, the right honorable Patricia Holland, who is Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Please, Secretary General. And then, secondly, we have Ms. Annika Solström, who is the Director General of the Swedish Food Agency, who is connected virtually in the Zoom link. And then, thirdly, we have Ms. Henley, who is a Senior Advisor in the U.S. Office of the Special Rep uh, Presidential Envoy for Climate. And then next we have Professor Dr. Medri Rozam, who is the Director for Environmental Affairs in the Ministry of National Development Planning. We also have Ms. Chalui, who is the Business Strategy Lead and the Chief Executive Officer of the Grain and Food Sector of Bula. Bula global food company. And last but not the least, we have our colleagues from the Global Food Banking Network, and they will introduce themselves as they make their presentation. So with that, and without any further ado, I will just start giving the panelists the opportunity to speak. We have a very, very limited time available. So I am calling on all panelists to be as brief and concise as possible. We're going to give a first round of five minutes for the first uh, introductory remarks on the, uh, the strategies that are being employed by your institution or country if applicable in this area of food loss and waste. And if there are any uh, particular advocacy or in, uh, information pieces you would like to leave with us. So um, we would like to give the first uh, opportunity to the right uh, honorable Patricia Scotland, who is the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Secretary General, we would like to give you this opportunity to tell us what your organization is going is doing in this area of food loss and waste, perhaps particularly with respect to addressing this issue of climate change, and maybe if there are some country level examples also that you could share, we will be very uh, happy. Thank you. that um, we've had that scientific analysis because it means that I don't have to repeat it all. But um, just so you know who we are, the Commonwealth is made up of 56 uh, member states. That's 2.5 billion people. That's one third of the world, 60% of whom are under the age of 30. And food waste has been a matter of huge important to us, particularly because we have 33 small states, 25 of them are island states, and 14 of the least developed countries. And as a result, we have been challenged as everyone else in terms of how do we feed our population. And the waste issue is of primary importance to us. And if I can just take the position in sub-Saharan Africa. You'll know as um, you look at the data on the board that about 40% of food waste happens in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, and it's lost post-harvest. You also know 
that between 10 to 20 percent of the total grain produced in that region is lost before the food reaches consumers. So what are we really talking about? We're talking about waste of food that could feed 48 million people for a year. And if I was thinking as we were looking at these figures, it's all very well to talk about food waste in terms of statistics, but I think we need to convert them into what it means for human beings. Because we know that the development of a child between the age of naught and 22 months is a direct correlation that that person may achieve by 22 years. So if a child does not receive the appropriate amount of nutrients, the likelihood is that they won't meet their developmental milestones, they won't meet their educational milestones, and their future will be impacted negatively. When you then think that those who suffer most are the women, and then the women and the children are going to be disadvantaged, it's a huge matter for all of us. So what did we do? We looked at the processes that our member states um, are engaged in, and we have come together with the three Rio conventions, and we have created the Living Lands Charter. Because we've been great, all of us, about making promises, but we've not been very good at actually implementing them. So the Living Lands Charter, which is um, being undertaken with the three Rio conventions, we're all working together, we are brigading our member states to come and look at what we do for water, for food, and land management, and husbandry of um, the animal. What that will mean is that we will be able to share what works, what does not work, and technologically, we'll be able to share data and experience. We're also looking at financing, because for many of our member states who don't have the technology, who don't, don't have the um, expertise, they don't also have data. So how do we get the data so they can make informed choices? That has meant that we need to look at money. Many of our countries do not have access to climate finance. So we have created a climate finance access hub in Mauritius. We're also placing climate finance advisors in 19 of our countries. We'd like to put climate finance advisor in every country that would want, to, want it. So far, we've, we've delivered into the hands of our member states $322 million, and we've got about $500 million in the pipeline. And that's come from a tiny investment of about $7.8 million. What does that mean? It means that when it comes to adaptation, when it comes to helping our farmers to plant properly, to understand how they must husband their land, they are able to do that. We're also using the geospatial data that comes from one of our projects, which we're calling Common Sensing. This has been a project that we've done in with uh, UNITAR, UNISAT, the British Space Agency, Catapult and others. Because what we know is if we can better predict rainfall, if we can better predict what's going to happen in terms of drought, then we can better prevent the um, loss that happens in land. The other thing that we are doing is we have looked at how we create policy support. So we must have trained about two and a half thousand climate finance advisors who will be able to continue to assist our member states. And we've looked at market um, access and supply chains. And one of the great opportunities we've now taken advantage of is to create an e-learning platform which will help member states to get the knowledge and the technology that they need. I would strongly invite all of you to look at our website, what we're doing, and to join us because what FAO is doing is critical to our better understanding as to how we manage our land and our uh, and, and address food waste more creatively. I think I've probably had my five minutes, but I could probably 
talk to you about what we're doing for the next 10 years. But Uni Krishnan, who is the head of our climate um, uh, a division in the Commonwealth Secretariat, is here. And I know that if I have to go, he'll take my seat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General Scotland, for that very, very uh, interesting insight into the approach that Commonwealth uh, Secretariat and its members are following. I think one of the points that struck me was the link you made to the issue of financing, which actually came out also very, very eloquently in the uh, keynote presentation by Dr. Terrell. Thank you very much. So now, uh, distinguished uh, participants, we're going to go to our next uh, speaker who is online. And I will call Ms. Annika Solström, who is the Director General of the Swedish Food Agency, to also share with us the experiences of Sweden in this uh, problematic area. Ms. Solström, I hand over the microphone to you, please. Go ahead. I think you are connected now. Yeah, thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. And thanks for inviting me to this event with such an important topic. As you said, I'm the Director General for the Swedish Food Agency. Today, I also represent the Nordic Council of Ministers. Food loss and waste are signs that something has gone wrong in our food system, and it's an untapped resource for climate action. <clears throat> Valuable resources are wasted through and through our value chain instead of becoming food on our foods. And to solve this, we need holistic approaches. So, therefore, in June this year, the Nordic ministers for food, fisheries, and agriculture they adopted, adopted a political commitment to stand by the SDG 12.3 and to halve the food loss and waste in 2030 in the Nordic countries. So reducing food loss and waste is actually a key priority now for all Nordic countries, and we are working actively to cut the amounts that are wasted. That is a major challenge. We have several uh, initiatives ongoing. Uh, several Nordic countries, including Sweden, we have voluntary agreements to reduce food loss and waste where representatives from the whole value chain can uh, meet, uh, regular, they meet regularly and they collaborate on different issues. And in April this year, we gathered the leading experts and decision makers at the Nordic Food Waste Summit to boost the Nordic ambition. So now we are initiating platforms to find common solutions, discuss challenges, and learn from each other. And the lessons learned will form like a knowledge base for us. What works in the Nordic countries in practice in real life and what doesn't work in the Nordic countries. So if I then uh, zoom in on Sweden, uh, our work in Sweden is National Action Plan was adopted 2018, and this action plan was drawn up together with all parties affected, from both public and private sector, and it has been very well received. Uh, and we have a good dialogue now with the with the food industry. Uh, and the Swedish Food Agency, we have an ongoing government assignment together with the Swedish Board of Agriculture and the Swedish Environment Protection. Protection Agency to reduce food loss and waste in Sweden. So reducing food loss and waste is an important topic and it has been that for quite some time. Mm -hmm. But we are glad to see now that it has got more and more attention in, in recent years. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, we measured food losses at the national level, level, both in primary production and in the food industry. And we did that for eight commodities. To do that, cooperation with stakeholders was the key. And we now know that several hundred thousand tons of food do not reach the retailers and the consumers. And I will give you some examples. 15% of the cattle at farms are wasted. One third of the carrots are wasted mainly because they were broken or having the wrong size. 17% of the potatoes are wasted and almost half of the edible byproducts from pigs and cattle at slaughter are wasted. 
and we calculated that the losses of beef, pork, and milk results in 330,000 tons of CO2 equivalents per year, which is actually 9% of the greenhouse gas emissions by animal husbandry in Sweden. So by reducing food losses, there is a potential to reduce greenhouse uh, emissions from the food sector, but also to increase food production without increasing the climate impact. Uh, <clears throat> reducing food loss and waste has become even more relevant now in, in the unstable world we live in, where the food prices have been rising for the last years, and also there is an increased focus on food security and climate change. And it has become even more evident that it is crucial that we use our resources wisely. When we recently asked the Swedish consumers about how the higher food prices affected them, they told us that they plan their purchases more than before, they take care of leftovers more than they did before, and they also use their senses to look, smell, and taste before they possibly throw away the food. So increased awareness and also the higher food prices seem to have had an effect on Swedish consumers. We know that a great deal of the food waste occurs at the household level, and therefore we have worked a lot with awareness and knowledge building uh, to the consumers. And in recent years, we have seen a decline up to 20% in the consumers' edible food waste. And we are now hopeful that this trend will continue. So this development is great for the consumers because they save money with relatively low effort and they also reduce the climate impact. So there is a lot of things going on now uh, regarding food waste. But really more needs to be done to reach the, the SDG 12.3. We have to step up the work and we have to do more. And all actors in the food chain need to work with reducing their food loss and waste. And Step one is measure. What is not measured is not seen. More actors need to measure their food loss and waste. And then step two is action. When you know where your food loss and waste occurs, you, you can and you need to take an action. And also we as authorities have the responsibility. We need to look at how we can use the flexibility in the food legislation to further reduce food waste. Both the food industry and the retailers have the possibility to reduce the food waste, but also the possibility to make it easier for the consumer to reduce their food waste. We do not encourage the consumers to buy more than they actually eat. So we are all important. We need to do this together, and we really have to see the, the food as a valuable resource. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tallstrom, for that uh, very, very brilliant uh, presentation on the approaches being adopted in uh, Sweden. Uh, I think it's uh, interesting. Uh, you uh, eloquently described one dimension of food systems development, the integration of the different parts of the public sector working together. I think that is uh, very, very uh, important. So we would then go ahead now to our next speaker. And she is Ms. Claire Henley, who is the senior advisor in the US Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. Ms. Henley, over to you. Thanks so much, Devon. I'll be very brief. Um, but I think I want to bring a perspective to this that I think isn't always brought to the food loss and waste issue. And um, I think we, there are, as we've heard, incredible reasons to care about food loss and waste and a lot of them, but we need more reasons because as we know from uh, looking at um, climate finance flows, food loss and waste is not, and agriculture generally is not getting enough funding. And so we need other reasons and we need other stakeholders to care about this issue. And that's one of the things, we are doing a lot of things within the US government of food loss and waste, but one thing that I wanna talk about today, because I think it's interesting and potentially not so common of a connection, is the connection to methane emissions. And we know that when um, food is, is lost or wasted, it often will either be burned on a field, it will be put in pits near a farmer's field, and it will 
produce methane or it will go to a, a landfill or a dump and produce methane emissions. Um, and I say this because I think that there is an interesting and important traction that short-lived climate pollutants are getting at this COP, but also um, recently, because we understand that as we are continuing to increase temperatures, we need some desperate relief. And CO2, reducing CO2 today does not give us a reduction in global temperatures. Only reducing short-lived climate pollutants gives us a reduction of global temp temperatures. And so I think that's one of the reasons why methane emissions are getting increased attention. Um, and I think it's a really compelling connection that we can make to food loss and waste as another reason to act on this important issue because um, food that is lost or waste wasted produces more than 10% of global methane emissions. Um, and it is, you know, uh, uh, one of another win. I think we've, we're probably at a list of like 10 or 12 wins for why we need to focus on this issue. Um, but it's, it is a compelling one for us to think about in particular as, uh, as we continue on this climate trajectory and need the short-term levers that we, every short-term lever that we can find. So I'll add that to the conversation. Um, and and say a few things that the U.S. is doing, in part, you know, inspired by and motivated by our interest and commitments on on methane. First of all, the U.S. has just released its first food loss, our domestic food loss and waste roadmap. So for the first time, we have had an integrated, full interagency effort. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Environmental Protection Agency, the White House actually led on the whole thing. Um, we have, for the first time, a food loss and waste reduction roadmap in the United States to meet SDG 12.3. Um, also, we are deploying our U.S. Um, aid agency to focus on food loss and waste and to focus on uh, methane more um, uh, in a more targeted way. So we've created a food loss and waste accelerator that was announced earlier this year with $10 million of seed funding at USAID to focus on, on food loss and waste. in in part, we got that funding because of the methane connection. Um, and we also are putting funding into um, to, uh, food loss and waste innovation through USAID. President Biden announced $60 million just last year, over five years, to focus on innovations that reduce uh, food loss and waste. Um, so those are some of the things we're doing domestically, internationally, to focus on this issue. And appreciate being here. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from the other panelists. Yeah, I think it's easier to, to move around with the microphone, so I will I will do this. So uh, the next uh, speaker, and then we will uh, then uh, definitely pull out the messages as well from Miss Henley's uh, uh, brilliant uh, pre presentation. We would like to hear now the uh, the examples and the lessons from Indonesia, and in this regard, we would like to call. Dr. Mel Drill Zam, I hope I am pronouncing your, your name correctly. Yeah. So please, you have uh, the, the floor now to make uh, your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Mel Drill Zam, so you spelled my name correctly. And um, actually, uh, in this uh, context, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitations, and we really would like to share our uh, experience. Actually, the issue of food loss and waste in Indonesia, we can say that probably it's just about two years. That's because of, I still remember that one publication from Economic Intelligence Unit stated that Indonesia it was the second largest contribution contributors for um, food loss waste generations. It's about 300 kilos per capita annually. As a director for environmental at the time, I didn't believe it. And actually, I asked my teams to, to um, uh, conduct special research on this. And actually, um, the research uh, found that from 2000 to 2019, um, Food loss, food loss and waste generation in Indonesia 
increasing yes it's correct increasing but not as big as 300 uh, kilos per capita build annual it's just about it's increasing from 115 kilogram per capita per year to 184 kilogram per capita per year in 2019 and of course um, it creates a loss for our economy it's about four to five percent of our gdp loss because of this issue and in 2019 if we can if we could if we would like to connect with our greenhouse gas emissions it's about 7.3 percent of our emissions comes from both loss and waste so you can see that's a big amount of uh, emissions and if we uh, kind of uh, make a, a projections towards uh, 2045 because we have targets of our ambitions in 2045 it's if we, if we have a kind of a, just a business as usual approach, uh, we could reach about 344 uh, kilogram per capita per year in our uh, contribution for our uh, food, loss and, food loss and waste generations. And those generations, actually, we identified that there are five aspects that we have to be very, very careful on this. The first about lack of a good handling practice that's the first issue i believe this is related to the loss and of course insufficient quality of storage we have a big big problem indonesia is a big country it's, it's a archipelagic like countries and we know that the fishery products it really requires storage uh, sufficient storage and market quality standards and consumer preference also creates these big issues and lack of information and education for woodworkers and consumers. And last but not least, this is quite funny, excess portions. So sometimes in our cultures, we eat a lot, but we do not eat everything, but we have to, we, we spare something and it's become food waste. So it's kind of consumer's behavior. So, um, after having that information, but probably you can cite it as well from FAO, from our publications. Um, we also conduct a kind of uh, studies, actually what happened in the market itself, because we know that there's something happened here. And right now, actually we have already identified that quite, quite many startups uh, emerge from the young one. Actually, we have counted that right now there are a lot of food banks in Indonesia, at least in 12 provinces. We have 34 provinces. Right now, there are 12 provinces have food bank institutions. And there are also some NGOs now operating in this food loss and waste campaign. And also right now, we have national food agencies, which are quite concerned on this issue as well. Three weeks ago, we just... Uh, uh, return back from Danes, and actually we learn a lot from Danes how then they manage food loss and waste as well. We work together right now with national food agencies, and really would like to see that they are also in a, actually in campaign about this food loss and waste handling. So the way forward, actually, uh, we also working with um, colleagues with many institutions, and at least there are five. Um, tangible actions that we are going to work with. The first is about uh, strengthening the regulations on food labeling. You know that in Indonesia, we just, uh, um, we don't have, uh, we don't differentiate between expire and best before label. So in Indonesia, we just have expiry date. So this is also a big issue for food loss and waste. And right now, our food drugs, uh, uh, food drugs agency also work on it. And also strengthening the food storage management. It requires also the energy transitions because we have to use a lot of uh, renewable energy now. And the guideline for food loss, uh, food surplus distributions. We have right now, uh, we have a plan to work together with uh, hotel, restaurant, and canteen industries. And food loss and waste data management, this is also crucial because we just uh, conducted the study from 2000 to 2019 and we have to monitor this as well. 
and I believe this is also the same uh, Congress. And last but not least, I believe uh, campaign is very crucial. And I know this is not a big, uh, this is a big issue for us, but uh, well, we have to start. That food loss, as food loss and waste, this is a big issue and communities, people have to understand this. And so that's why collaboration is very crucial, not only with the, with the government agencies, with the practitioners and also with the media. We really, we, we really would like to see that the media also campaign about this. So that's why then, you know, the issue of foodland, foodless and waste can also become not only just the government understanding, but also people's understanding. Perhaps, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Medril Zam, for uh, just summarizing very, very uh, eloquently the uh, the situation in Indonesia and actually the, the actions that are being taken, uh, ranging from just building capacities to uh, raising awareness about this issue and uh, putting in place the, the different structures from a regulatory to uh, an institutional uh, dimension. I think uh, those aspects as well echo very well with what uh, Ms. Henley had uh, uh, eloquently described in the case of the United States of America, as well as the, uh, the agency USAID in terms of the interventions that are being are taking to uh, to support uh, various uh, countries, and I think in that case the um, the the underscoring that there is a lot of uh, money out there, but it's targeted in the areas that are not traditionally linked to the issue of food loss and waste. And I think point that was made very very clearly was that we need to really find ways of tapping into those resources that are available. So thank you very much. So we've 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 done a, a tour de table, as it were, looking from the public sector, looking at the experiences of uh, institutions and also governments, kind of from the public sector side. So, but as many of you have uh, articulated very very eloquently, all partners need to work on this. So it involves the private sector, civil society, consumers, and academic institutions, just to name a few. We have the opportunity here that we have uh, two representatives, as it were, of the private sector. And we, we're going to hear their on site. And let's see whether it differs very much from the public sector side. But first off, I would like to call on um, Ms. Ikram Shalui, who is the business strategy lead and the CEO of the grain and food sector of Bula. Please, Ms. Ikram, maybe you can start by just introducing Bula because many uh, here present and also connected online may not know what Bula does. But all of that in five minutes together with what you do that can contribute to addressing this issue of food loss and waste as a contribution to climate action. Over to you, Ms. Ikra. Great. Thank you very much, Yvonne, and good evening to you all. Um, great to, and appreciated to be here uh, this evening to talk about this challenging topic that affects us all and as well introduced by Divine um, public and the private sector, because at the end of the day, if we're here today is that we all believe that uh, feeding uh, the, the, the planet and feeding humans uh, is as important and we need to uh, collectively work um, to reach that goal. So first, some, some few words about Buter Group. Um, Buter is a family-owned uh, company uh, that operates globally um, and actively providing agro-processing technologies and solutions uh, in the grains, food, and food. Um, and what that means in terms of numbers uh, is that out of the 8 billion people worldwide, well, about 2 billion people each day do enjoy food produced on butter. And so with the depth, um, this global reach uh, comes a great responsibility that we embrace, the one that puts uh, sustainability 
um, food security, food safety, and as well as nutrition uh, at the center of uh, our mission, and therefore um, the solutions and services that we offer. Um, we do believe that providing adequate food and nutrition within more sustainable uh, food value chains is more important than ever. Uh, and we collaborate extensively with academia, uh, with our customers, uh, with the, with uh, and also with the public sector to develop solutions in that sense. Major opportunities lie in reducing the antibiotic use uh, and CO2 footprint of livestock, um, developing great testing meat and dairy alternatives, and also um, by the same way, reducing waste, water, and energy use along those value chains. Uh, so, to give you some concrete examples, given the, the, the short time, uh, first, um, I would focus on the, the, the post harvest loss that was also mentioned uh, earlier uh, uh, by a panelist. And, and yes, it's a reality uh, why we tend to focus on the from farm to fork losses well there is a critical stage where um where we see a lot of loss uh, which is right after the the harvest um because of contamination because uh, of inappropriate storage conditions uh, and that worldwide let's say it's 25 percent actually of crops are contaminated with mycotoxins uh, in africa alone uh, that's 49 million tons of losses annually um, and so there is a gap that we need to bridge there. Uh, and as a solution provider for storage, um, we see that the first step really for chief food safety and by the same way also um, sustainability is that post-harvest stabilization of the crop, which means drying the goods in proper conditions. Because if you don't dry, if you don't store the grain properly, then you risk spoilage and contamination of the grain. Um, and, and, and therefore, it's, it's critical to focus on that part and have the right infrastructure across the world uh, to ensure uh, to, to, to save the right amount of harvest. Second example uh, I would like to share is um, basically how we focus and how we develop on building uh, sustainable capacity building and resilient value chains. Uh, so we committed uh, over four years ago uh, to uh, provide by 2025, which is basically tomorrow, uh, to provide solutions that reduce energy, water, and waste by 50% in the value chains of our food and feed processors, so our uh, direct customers. A concrete solution, a concrete example that I can share with that is about that is the food park concept that we developed. Um, so let me take you back today to what what we you can find out there in, in, in the market. Today, the traditional food value chain consists of individual and fragmented food production sites. And in a food park, uh, different food and feed production sites are actually gathered and clustered to only one location. Naturally, this contributes toward numerous sustainability development goals, such as zero hunger, good health, and well-being, as well as uh, economic empowerment, decent work, and growth uh, in the region. In addition, um, the food park also enables actually circular economy. Uh, because the reuse of waste is maximized in a food park, it can be used, um, the, the byproducts can be used either to as um, uh, another ingredient in the food processing uh, chains or to generate thermal energy and therefore minimize the use of natural resources. So as a result, GHG emissions and uh, costs uh, can be reduced uh, through, a through a food park. Um, I can go on forever with examples and, and types of solutions that uh, can help uh, and, and actively contribute to reducing food um, uh, loss and also uh, in enhancing climate neutrality. But I would say there is one key element to achieve all of that. Even if we have developed the right technology uh, or, or the right equipment, if there is no collaboration, no um, true uh, partnership between the public and private sectors, so cross sector, but also inside the same sector, having all the key stakeholders in the in those value chains actively involved to uh, this common goal, then we can launch it. So I'd say let's bridge the gaps, let's transform the, the challenges that we have today in our food and ag uh, value chains into opportunities 
by closely collaborating uh, among each other. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ikram. And uh, you um, you brought very, very interesting uh, dimensions. Uh, Bueller worked a little bit on the on the uh, the side of the chain where losses occur. And uh, you have highlighted some uh, interventions that uh, your uh, company is is undertaking. Now we're going to go a little bit further down along that same chain and see things a bit more from the uh, the consumer side and uh, at least in the downstream side of the chain and we're going to look uh, at a call on miss anna catalina suarez who is the senior director for strategy and innovation of the global food banking network Ms. Suarez, in five minutes, if you could just tell us what the, the network is and some of your major interventions and priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Divine. Thank you for the invitation. Hi, everyone. Good night. Looks like. I hope that is the last intervention. Just let me say that in GFN, we believe that there is an intrinsic connection between food loss and waste, climate change, and hunger. And we need to recognize that connection, but at the same time, resolve the connection, resolve the issue that that connection is creating. It's for that that we believe that at the same time that we are resolving the structural problems, as Maximo was mentioning, we need to avoid food loss and waste immediately. It's for that that GFN is an organization that is working across more than 50 countries with more than 600 food banks in the in the in the territory with the countries, increasing the amount of food that we are recovering. And we have been recovering and reducing food loss and waste since 1967. Then food bank has been avoiding food loss and waste for the last 50 years. And we are very is 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 we are seeing that it's very important that this topic is becoming more and more important. We have been shouting, saying, please, food loss and waste is an issue. Please, we need to work on that. And we really receive very glad the interconnection that the COP28 is doing about food systems and climate change, because we believe that is very important. And at the same time, we believe that it's important to resolve the structural issues at the same time that we are reducing food loss and waste. Many of the times that we are speaking with, with the companies that we are working, they say, no, we want to avoid food loss and waste. And we say, yes, absolutely. But don't say, don't send the food to the landfills while you are trying to innovate. Please keep the food in the supply chain, send the food to the food banks, while your innovation teams are resolving the structural issues that you are facing. And that is the main message that we are sending in this moment. And I think um, I, I want to do a relevance. You were mentioning the methane point. With the Global Methane Hub, we are working to create the methodology that is going to measure the amount of methane emissions that we are avoiding keeping the food in the supply chain. And this is very important because we are going to do the distinguish between keeping, really keeping the food in the supply chain beside to feeding animals or by industrial uses, because we want to demonstrate that it's very important to keep the food in the supply chain, having in mind the numbers about hunger that Maximo was presenting. This is the first. You will mention a second element that I think is very important. We have been working with Harvard the last five years, because we believe that we need to improve the different policies that are working in the different countries about food loss and waste. We are seeing, as you were mentioning about the labeling point, that there are some uh, barriers that are increasing food loss and waste. It's for that that the ATLAS and the work that we are doing about the policy work, not just in donations, in policy, in general, in food loss and waste, we are talking about food safety, we are talking about liability, um, is, is getting more and more important to create different uh, instruments in country to avoid uh, food loss and waste. And the last and not less important that we were speaking with the team, the, FAO, the nutritional FAO team before is the nutritional impact of the food that we are avoiding to go to the 
to the landfills. And this is huge and is going to be the most important work that we are doing because we were speaking before, we are talking about kilos, but we need to talk about people. That kilos that we are saving means nutrition for people in need. That food that we are saving implicates energy. We are talking about minerals. We are talking about vitamins. We are talking about people that is living a life without opportunities. And we, if we don't close the gap in the nutritional aspect, the poverty and hunger issue, issue is not going to resolve. Then GFN is doing three key elements. The first one is increase the awareness and compromises from the companies that are working with food to avoid food loss and waste. The second is uh, knowledge sharing, and you were mentioning before, this is huge and very important. We recognize the diversity of the cultures and the diversity of the capacities that the local teams of GFN have. And based on that, we increase the knowledge sharing, recognizing that we don't know anything. It's the people on the field that they are resolving with innovation, the general issues. And the last and no less important is getting resources. I'm talking about knowledge, I'm talking about money, I'm talking about sharing, networking. We are getting money to support the food banks and members in the country that are resolving the food loss and waste problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Suarez, I had promised that we would have uh, one or two interventions from the floor, and I want to keep my promise. If there could be a show of hand, and just uh, we, we, we've we run out of time. It was so interesting, but definitely we can we can hear, uh, we can take one or two questions. Please, over to you. If you, if you would like to introduce yourself and just uh, see what your question is. Hi, it's, re it's really great to see this uh, session on food losses and waste. My, my name is Charlie Spillan. I'm from the Rhine Institute at the University of Galway in Ireland. Um, now, one thing that's really struck me was that uh, Massimo's um, presentation highlighted that fruit and vegetables are, are a hot spot for food losses and waste. And that's juxtaposed, I think, to some extent against some recent studies that have shown that in terms of transport-related food emissions, fruit, fruits and vegetables are also the highest um, emitters in that sense. And so I'd, I'd like to hear what the panel's kind of reflections are, are on you know, what can be done about that, because if you want to increase um, the supply, then you have to improve the supply chain in terms of refrigeration, which are going to drive the emissions up. So questions about kind of length of supply chains, trade-offs, and then the question around affordability of fruits and vegetables for people, uh, depending on what ex the expenses around the supply chain related to keeping uh, fruit, fruits and vegetables, you know, in edible format. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting question. Uh, we, we're going to take one more if there is, and then we give the opportunity for responses. Okay. And just uh, leading with the support team, just bear with us a little. So. I'm so sorry. Um, hi, my name is Clara Nink. I run a startup called Farm to Feed in Kenya, where we aggregate imperfect and surplus produce, and we um, repurpose that into the market. We've actually created a new formal market for it. Uh, we're measuring data real time in terms of what farmers are putting on the platform, what the reason is. Is it a broken carrot? Is it a flat potato? Is it because of drought, bad quality seeds? Is it because of harvesting techniques? All different reasons, and we're doing the methane measurement. Now, I'm so surprised by this panel, and I wanted to say that I completely agree that we have to get together because I had no idea that all these things were going on. I knew the FAO was, was doing it. I have heard of the food bank in Kenya. Uh, but I would really like, after the session, to actually do something to get all the actors together. Uh, I'm sure that I have a lot of data to share, and I'm sure that you have a lot of data to share and, and other partners. So I um, would really invite that after the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very pertinent uh, question. Uh, what I, I would like to do now is just to give the panelists a short round, one or two minutes, either to respond, if you, you can, 
to any of the questions that are raised, but also to uh, make your final remarks with regard to your particular entry point in terms of experiences and recommendations from your point of view. So we're going to start with our virtual participants uh, this time, and we would uh, we would like to start with uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Solstrom, who is the uh, Director General of the Swedish Food Agency. Ms. Solstrom, please, if you want to kindly make your closing remarks and if you have any response to any of the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure I heard the, the first intervention because the connection was a bit bad, but I think it was about how to how to decrease the food and the waste the, the waste from fruits and vegetables. And uh, I think in, in Sweden at least it has a lot to do with the consumers being prepared to eat more ugly fruit and vegetables because they we have this um, idea that they have to look perfect and they have to be prepared. And also to increase the knowledge how to take care of or put that for something a little bit older, maybe a bit drier. And so, on. so that's one way. And I totally agree that we have to get all the actors together. Um, I think uh, it's important to work together with the public and private sector, but also between together with different countries. And we are doing this on a Nordic basis now, but uh, I'm sure that we would be more than willing to to be. Collaboration with, with more countries because there are examples and also to learn what doesn't work. So I think the Nordic countries are very prepared to increase our collaboration with other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Ikram, please, if you could come in. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, so about uh, about the lady who, who, who brought up uh, her, her amazing work in Kenya. Um, to 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 link the the farm uh, to feed um, and reduce food loss there. I mean, this is a concrete example on on how every progress toward the new balance of nature, humanity, and economy depends on people, on, on their skills, on their behavior, uh, behavior collaboration, and the ecosystems we build around it. Um, and that's why, for as a closing remark, I would like to to, to really bring. The element that we haven't covered so far, which is education. Um, this is uh, for any type of transformation. Uh, I would say this is the basis. This is the table on on which a transformation sits. And uh, empowering the local communities everywhere in the world around the farm, but also around the processing uh, and around the 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 um, and where consumer behavior uh, is key to change. Uh, and as much as, as we, uh, public and private sectors, uh, can collaborate together, uh, we really depend on, on, on the humans at the end and, and their skills. Uh, so really making sure that we find ways uh, to involve them in this transformation, I think, is a, is a key element to, su to success. Uh, and, and as builder group, we've been um, very active in this area, having training schools uh, locally, uh, for instance, uh, in Kenya uh, as well, um, Ruby, where we basically discover together with the um, uh, uh, local population, uh, how can we make better use of the local business uh, and therefore uh, not depend on import and also empower uh, the, the local and stable products that are culturally appropriated in each region. Uh, and I think that helps a lot with food loss and waste, but also with uh, the climate neutrality uh, as we uh, go towards a closed loop uh, within the same uh, continent and the same uh, region. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ms. Ikram. And then we pass it on to uh, Ms. Henley. Thank you. Uh, exciting stuff. I think that it's a show of real belief in food loss and waste. The folks are still here. So kudos to you. And um, I think I'd, I continue to be heartened by people who are committed to the intersection of all of these areas, committed to the intersection of mitigation and adaptation, committed to the intersection of food and climate. So it's great to be sitting here with you all virtually and in person and um, would love to continue this work with all of you. I would like to respond to the first question. We are working um, very hard with all of the food banks across the world in something that we call virtual food banking network. 
because we recognize that we are producing emissions at the same time that we are recovering uh, food surplus and avoiding emissions, avoiding the food going to the landfill. And the virtual food banking network is a model where we are doing a proximity, economies of proximity, that is something that we are connecting where the food is available but it's not going to be sold with the communities that are close to that food. That is avoiding to create bigger warehouses spaces to have many trucks and transportation going around the cities between cities and the rural areas. Um, then that allowed us to increase the amount of food that is available in the different spaces, but at the same time reducing the amount of logistic um, capacity that we were using before. This is something that we are promoting. In this moment, we are working with that model. We are starting in Africa, but we are working in UK, for example, that has been working the last 10 years, but in Chile, for example, too, is a model that we are strengthening. And just to close, I just would like to read, to read something that I was writing while I was hearing, like a, don't buy the idea that we need to wait for the future in the urgent things as hunger and food loss and weight. There, are, there is a better present for the most vulnerable people. And is reinforcing food recovery and redistribution while the structural problems are resolved. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Suarez. And we'll hand it over now to uh, Mr. Unikrishan Nye, who is coming in for the first time in place of uh, Secretary General Scotland. Ms. Uh, Mr. Nye is the head of climate change for the Commonwealth Secretariat, and he's in a very good position to at least explain the difficult uh, questions that we have. But unfortunately, we're almost out of time. So maybe in the next one or two minutes, please. Thank you. I, I think it was a very engaging discussion. We, we heard a lot of uh, good inputs from the speakers. But for my, uh, my final word is, I think uh, uh, having seen the post-harvest losses from within the government and from outside, from private sector, and now with the communal secretariat, I think there are multiple factors that lead to the prevailing post-harvest losses uh, when you look at the farmer's field, actually. It's uh, starting from labor issues to technology to finance to, um, of course, uh, market. So I think we need a holistic approach to look at the post-harvest uh, losses. And of course, I think the, the mitigation side of it and the adaptation side of it are the next level of the problem. But when you analyze the extent of financing that has gone into the agriculture value chain from production till harvest, and if you look at the part of GDP, the agriculture GDP that goes into um, this bit, it should be around 60 to 70 percent. But if you look at the extent of financial resources that is going into the post-harvest management, that runs into two or three percent in many of the countries, actually. So how will you uh, ensure technologies uh, to have better harvesting practices, to ha have better post-harvest management when you don't have financial incentives or maybe financing mechanisms available in this space. I think the gentleman's question in terms of how, how the, the, the transportation and the call chains and the emissions therein, if the harvesting is not proper, then obviously your intensity of energy that you need to spend to store these commodities obviously will go up actually so so i think it's a, it's a it's a it's a larger issue than climate of course climate is uh, contributing and also um, uh, the post harvest management and, or the post harvest losses is contributing to climate change but i think it's a much larger issue that requires a, a comprehensive solution uh, at, at the level of policy financing capacities and knowledge management thank you thank you very much Okay, um, well, this is a very interesting uh, discussions and we learn a lot. And for Indonesia itself, you know that we have about 280 million populations to be family. And of course, this is not an easy issue, both loss and waste, and uh, this is a complex issue. But um, we uh, start from this year, we have already done quite so many things. and. Um, Line agencies right now have been uh, working on this, but of course we just uh, cannot wait everything until perfect. We do what we can do. Uh, start from the simple thing first. 
So right now, uh, there are quite many uh, food banks have been operationalized. And we also working together, very simple one, with the hotel industries. So then we will show that handling the food loss and waste actually can be part of our uh, efforts to reduce the emissions. That is one intention, actually, for the short term, to show to the public that, also, okay, we can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And with that, I think we, we've come to, to the end. We could, we could very well continue this discussion for the next day and the next day. I think it's a, it's a very, very complex, but very, very interesting topic. Um, some, some very, very important uh, things uh, came out of this discussion. I think the, uh, the, the question that came um, from uh, our uh, colleague here actually underscores the complexity of, of the problem. We have the most nutrient-rich uh, uh, food products that are the most perishable. And the best way to handle them is by cooling. And right in there, you see the complexity of the situation and why the nutritional dimension and the healthy diets cannot be separated from the environmental and the economic dimension, which then definitely speaks very well to an issue that I think uh, came out from the panel. We need to have this systemic approach that looks at, at the whole issue, that looks at the trade-offs and minimizes the trade-offs in terms of how we want to achieve these lofty goals that we, we, we so much desire. Very, very clearly from the discussion, it is clear that we need to find means and ways to get the financing that is, is going into, uh, into addressing climate change. We need to get that financing more and more into agriculture and also into addressing this uh, particular issue. It was also I think very, very clear, and that built on one of the presentations that Mr. Torero had up there. We need to work together. We need to collaborate. So my call to you is to echo that call that you should join the coalition. There is a coalition on this very topic that the UN agencies are spearheading, but let's also have the public, the public sector and the private sector join this coalition so that together we can work uh, to address this very, very challenging issue. And with that, I want to thank the panelists for their very, very brilliant contributions to this session. It was, in fact, without, I, I, I lose the words, uh, and I think I would have to go and listen uh, to the video again to distill these very, very rich messages. So I want to thank you very, very much. And I would like to thank those participants that are also connected online for their uh, interest in this session, and definitely all our colleagues and friends who came to attend the session in person. And last but not the least, also our support crew who have been behind the success of the session. Thank you very much and have a good evening.